there's somebody up there? What is behind each door? When we find different doors in front of us, it's a little bit like truth. When I think about it, any honest, rational, intelligent thinking person, when they're confronted with truth, they have to acknowledge it as such. Millions of people have been confronted with truths found in the Word of God, yet it's brought about no real change in their lives. Maybe you too have been confronted with something in the Word of God, but it hasn't changed your life. When you're willing to expend your time, your energies for your cause, your message, whatever it might be, people will call you zealous. They'll tell you that you're full of zeal. The word zeal conveys the idea of boiling over. It's where you're full of it and you can't contain it. You know, when you think about it, should Christians be zealous? We know that in the world people will be zealous maybe for their sports, maybe for their business, whatever it might be. But how about a Christian in your Christian faith, in your experience, your walk with God? Should you be zealous as a Christian? That also is something that we should think about. When you think about truth, when you think about knowledge, there's one thing that I discovered, and that is that any rational, honest, intelligent person who is able to reason, to think things out, that they would have to acknowledge truth when they hear it. Anyone who says, oh, you know, I'm seeking for truth, and, and they may call themselves an atheist, or they may call themselves a Buddhist, or, or, or a Methodist, or a, a Hindu, or anything. But when they are confronted with truth, they will acknowledge it. Whether they want to follow that truth is a whole nother matter. Whether they want to apply those truths to their life is irrelevant. They will acknowledge and say, I know that this here is true. But you know, there needs to be more than that. Because many people can look at the Bible. There is many people, thousands, maybe millions of people, who have discovered, who have heard, who have learned truths, especially truths from the Word of God. But it's brought about no change in their lives. What purpose would a a whole table of food be to a hungry man if he never ate. What use is truth if we don't apply it to our lives? We need the realities of truth, especially the truths of the Word of God, to impact our lives in a real way. You know, each person we have our own reality. You know, we live in our own world. We know the things around us, our family, our friends, our likes, our dislikes. The way that we view events in the world. But we need to be open to God's superior understanding in all things. We need to be able to see the reality of the world in the view that God gives. That's looking behind things and seeing what's really behind this and what's behind that? What is the purpose to so many things? Have you ever seen somebody that was excited? I mean, really enthusiastic. Are you enthusiastic about anything? I mean, is there anything you're like, oh, someone, you know, you might be in a, in a crowded room and you just hear this key word and you're like, oh, I'm going to go over that direction because that's actually a topic that I'm interested in. In fact, that's something that I know a bit about because I've studied it, I've learned about it. It might be different things for different people. 
but you hear it and you want to go there because you're enthusiastic about it. Maybe it's a message. Maybe it's a cause or, or, or some, something that's going on. You know, you notice these types of people, and it's not just religious people, it's not just Christian people. But these people that are like that, you'll notice that they're willing to make sacrifices for their cause, for their, their thing, whatever it may be. They're willing to sacrifice their money, their time. They're willing to do so many different things for their cause. You know, we use a word, we say, these people are very zealous. The word zealous means to boil, to boil over. You have a pot of water, you leave it on the stove, and it starts to boil over in the bubbles, it starts to come out. It describes the people, doesn't it? Because when you talk to them, they always talk about their cause. Yes, you might start off and you talk about the weather, but eventually, and not usually that long away, you get to speaking about their cause, their thing. They're known for it. What is it that motivates them? You might say, well, you know, it's just in their blood. It's just the way they are. It's in their blood. That's what they do. Their father did that and their grandfather did that. It's in their blood that they can't do anything else. Should a Christian be zealous? Should those who know the truth be zealous for the truth? But you know, we get people that say, hang on, you don't want to go overboard. Don't get carried away. In fact, turn your Bible across to Acts chapter 26. We find someone in Acts chapter 26, looking at verse 24, who said just this. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning does make thee mad. Paul's just been sharing the gospel about Jesus Christ who died and then he rose again. And Festus is like, whoa, you've gone mad. You're beside yourself. You're a fanatic. You're extreme. You know, normally we don't like those words. You know, someone who's a fanatic, they're extreme. That's just gone. You've gone too far. It's too much. But you know, sometimes we can cut those words a little bit shorter and they're okay. Because if I say, well, you know, I'm a rugby fan. Or I'm a fan of this particular band or, or this singer or, 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 or this sport or whatever it is. The word fan, where does it come from? It's a shortened word from the word fanatic. Someone who's fanatical, it means, well, I'm fanatical about this particular person or this thing. Should we be fanatical about God? I mean, do you want to be called fanatic or extreme? Is anyone a fan of God? You know, when you think about it, is there anyone in the Bible, you know, is there anyone you can think of throughout the history of Christendom, throughout the history of those who have followed God, who God said, well, you know, that person, they were too much. Now, I'm not talking about crazy people who go and do things that are contrary to the Word of God. They may kill people and hurt people all in the name of the Word of God. That's not what God asks in the, in the Word. But does God ever say, well, you know, yeah, that guy, I mean, he was crazy. He was a fanatic. You mean, you know the guy I'm talking about. He went and built that boat. Spent 120 years building it. Spent everything he had to buy resources to get help and to build it. Only problem is it wasn't near any water. That guy was too much. Do you read that in the Bible? You don't find it. It's not in there. No one was fanatical in the Bible. Yes, there was people that called them fanatics. They would have seen Noah and said, that wild fanatic. That guy's just extreme. It's never going to rain. It's not going to happen. Yes, so don't expect people out there. Yes, they'll say you're fanatical. But God won't when you follow his word. Because he asks us to follow his word. In fact, turn across to the book of Titus, chapter 2. 
And let's have a look down there at verse 14. The Bible says, Who gave himself for us, speaking of Jesus Christ, that we, that he rather, might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. The word peculiar there means special treasure. Another way that word's translated in the scriptures is they translate it to the word jewel. A peculiar people. He goes on and finishes there saying, zealous of good works. You know, people say, well, you know, it's like getting blood out of a stone. What does that mean? It means that person's a real hard case, you know, not as in funny, but they're real hard to get them to do anything or to say anything. You know, it's like when I think about it, throughout, and I'm not knocking it, but throughout Christendom, there are so many courses and things that people run in churches to get people to share their faith. Now, I've studied the Bible, and I know they had schools of the prophets, but I don't find anything in the Scriptures where they had to run lots of church programs to get people to share about what they believed. Because someone who is zealous, someone who has come to Jesus Christ and he has done so much for them, it's just natural they want to stand up and they want to share. And yes, it may be in different capacities. We may be very timid at at the beginning because I'm naturally timid about speaking to so many people. It may only be to one or two people. But you don't need to you don't need to egg me on because it's just in me, it's just gonna come out. I'm just going to share it. Zeal in religion is a burning desire. I mean burning, it's just coming up. It's a burning desire to please God, to do His will, to advance His cause and His glory. In this world, in whatever way you can. It is a, it is a desire which no man feels by nature. It's not something that's natural within us. It's something that the Holy Spirit puts within us when he touches our lives, and every believer, when he is converted, is this way. But some people are a little bit more zealous than others. You would call them zealous Christians. This desire is so strong When it really rains in a man, it impels him to make any sacrifice. To go through any trouble, you say, hey man, that's no trouble. That's no bother. It doesn't bother me. I don't mind. I'm happy to suffer, to work, to labor, to toil, to spend and to be spent. And even to die. Do we have examples, not just in the scriptures, but throughout history, of followers of Jesus Christ who were willing to give up everything? If only they could please God and honor Christ. A zealous Christian is a spirit-filled Christian. You know, I ask the question, you know, can your zeal, can it be held back? If that pot of water is boiling over, can you put the lid on it and just hold it down? What's going to happen? The pressure is just going to get more and more. And what's going to happen? It's actually going to explode bigger than if you just left it. Turn your Bible back to 1 Corinthians, just back a little bit. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and looking at verse 28. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Here Paul is talking to the Corinthian church. He's talking on the subject of speaking in tongues. And it seems that these people, people were jumping up here and there, and and they were wanting to speak in tongues. And he says, well actually, if there's no one to interpret, just be quiet. Don't get up, don't say anything. But if there is, well then, hey, you can get up and you can speak. 
No interpreter, don't speak. Interpreter, you can speak. This verse tells us that the Corinthian believers had the ability to speak in tongues or to keep silent. Now think about this for a minute because this is what I started to th- this is what I started to think. Now I started to think can you remain silent if the Holy Spirit has given you a message to speak? Uh, is it possible that you can just say, well, actually, no, I'm going to remain silent? Turn your Bible across to 1 Samuel chapter 10. 1 Samuel chapter 10. Here we find Saul has not been crowned king yet, but his father's donkeys have gone missing. Kish. And the Bible tells us that Saul went out looking for them. And verse 10 of chapter 10 says, And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him. And the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. And it came to pass that when all knew him beforehand, saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets, that the people said one to another, What is this that has come unto the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? He was out there looking for the donkeys. And then he comes upon a group of prophets, and the Spirit of God is there. And then he's there with them, and he can't help but prophesy. Chapter 19, still in 1 Samuel, chapter 19. We know that Saul became angry with David. I'll begin in verse 19. And it was told Saul, saying, Behold, David is at Naarothian Ramah. And Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying, and Samuel standing as appointed over them, the Spirit of God was upon the messengers of Saul, and they prophesied. Here they were meant to be grabbing David, but instead the Spirit of God came upon them, and they began to prophesy. Word gets back to Saul. And so he sends more messengers. Read down there, verse 21. And when it was told Saul, he sent other messengers, and they prophesied likewise. They came into the same environment, and they also prophesied. But it didn't just happen the two times. It happened a third time. The Bible says, and Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they prophesied also. But go another step, verse 22. Then went he as Saul also to Ramah and came to the great well that is at Skew. And he asked and said, Where are Samuel and David? And once he behold, they are at Naoth and Ramah. And he went thither to Naoth and Ramah. And the Spirit of God was upon him also. And he went on and prophesied until he came to Naoth and Ramah. So he was going there. He wants to kill David. He sends three groups of men. They all prophesy. Then Saul himself comes. And what happens to him? He prophesies to the point, verse 24, and he stripped off his clothes. It doesn't mean he was naked, but he took off all his kingly and and, and his nice clothes. He stripped off his clothes and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and lay down naked all the day and all the night. Wherefore they say, is Saul also among the prophets. You do not use the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will use you. You cannot turn the Holy Spirit off. If you are under the influence of the Holy Spirit, you cannot keep silent if He has given you a message. You know, we find... In the book of Acts, three separate occasions where the Holy Spirit comes upon people and they speak in tongues. Now, we know this is not just some gibberish. This was an actual language that the people could understand. So it's not some of this crazy stuff that some of our brothers and sisters in different churches do. Three times, the day of Pentecost, 
where people from all over the world had come to Jerusalem. And so God gave the ability through the gift of the Holy Spirit where they were able to communicate the gospel to them in their language. And that's why they said, well, I hear it in my language. And the other guy says, hey, I hear it in my language. The second occasion is in Acts chapter 10. Peter was sent to Cornelius. Remember, he had the dream and and the sheet, and and he's up there, and then the messengers come, and he goes to Cornelius. Cornelius was Italian. But it wasn't just Cornelius there. It was his family. His family was Italian. And his men were Italian. And so God gave them the gift of tongues, and they were able to communicate the gospel and to share the message of Jesus Christ. The third occasion in Acts chapter 19 in the Ephesus, and they were sharing with some men that were Greeks. Do you know what language these Greeks spoke? Greek. And so once again, the gift of tongues was given. But you know, I always find it interesting. Even though we find those three occasions where you find people speaking in tongues... Why? Because they are filled with the Holy Spirit. I find six other occasions where people in just the book of Acts are said to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And they don't speak in tongues, but they do something different. Turn your Bible over to Acts chapter 9. What do they do? They didn't speak in tongues. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 9, looking at verse 27. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. This is talking about the apostle Paul. And Barnabas says, hey, this guy's okay. He's converted. And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem and he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed among the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. You know, I find all these occasions with these people filled with the Holy Spirit, as the Apostle Paul was, and they spoke boldly. They were bold to speak for Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 18, verse 26. Speaking of Apollos, and he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Here was this guy, Apollos. He had just heard some things. He didn't know everything. You don't have to know everything to share your faith. He only knew some things, but he went and started sharing it. And they're like, wow, this guy's speaking bold. He's confident. And they went and they said, hey, can we share more with you? Give you the bigger picture. Help you to understand. Go back to verse 24. The Bible says from verse 24, And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit. He spake, and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. He was confident. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he spoke boldly, regardless of the consequences. Second Corinthians. Turn to Second Corinthians chapter six. Second Corinthians chapter six. Looking down. At verse 10, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing all things. You know, everybody likes nice clothes, nice shoes. You know, we want a nice phone, a a car, all these different things. But imagine if you had none of that. 
Imagine if suddenly your nice clothes and your shoes and your car or your house or your phone or whatever it is that you value, imagine if that was gone. Imagine if you were just you poor in rags and nothing. Would people still want to talk to you if you had nothing? You know, the Bible tells me when I read about Jesus, it says that there was no beauty in him. You know, the attractive person, people, oh, well, I want to hang around this person. They're attractive. I want to be near to them. Jesus wasn't like that. Isaiah 53 says that there was no beauty in him, that they should desire him. No one was drawn to him for that. Are people drawn to you because you can speak the words of life? And they're not your words, because I don't have any words of life. But he gave me some. Would people want, they're like, man, I just, they're hanging off your word. And it might only be your testimony. You might think, well, I can't remember all the verses. Share your testimony. You know, no one can argue with that. That's the one thing I discovered that you are the world authority on. You want to be a world authority on something? I stand up and I say, well, you know, actually, I'm going to talk about something. And in fact, I'm the world authority. There's no one higher than me that can talk on this. What is it? It's my testimony. It's what God has done in my life. Having nothing, yet possessing all things. The zealous Christian, whether he lives or whether he dies, whether he has health or whether he has sickness, whether he is rich or whether he is poor, whether he pleases man or whether he gives offense, whether he is thought wise or whether he is thought foolish, whether he gets blamed or whether he gets praised, whether he gets honor or whether he gets shame. For all of this, the zealous man cares nothing at all. He burns for one thing, and why that one thing is to please God and to advance God's glory. If he is consumed in the burning, he is content. Turn across to Philippians chapter 4. You know Philippians Chapter 4, and when I say verse 13, you know the verse that I'm talking about. What does your memory tell you? I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And this verse is very common. It's very popular. It's very well known. But what is the true context? You know, as I say, Philippians 4.13 comes after Philippians 4. 4, 11, and 12. So let's read back from verse 11. The Bible says here very clearly, not that I speak in respect of want. He says, I'm not complaining, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, whether I'm rich, whether I'm poor, whether I'm in health, whether I'm sick, whether everyone loves me, whether everyone hates me, I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Remember Peter said, be ready always to share your faith. And what did he say? He said, in season and out of season. When you feel like it and when you don't feel like it. When you're rich and everything looks like it's going well or when you're poor and broke and got so many bills. When everybody's loving you and they're rejoicing and praising you and say, wow, you're so great, you're doing good things. Wow, you're so wonderful. And everyone says, when everyone's saying, wow, I didn't know that person's dodgy. I don't like that person. It doesn't matter. 
Because he says there, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Romans chapter 10. Paul, speaking about his brethren, said these words. Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Here, talking about the literal nation of Israel. Paul's saying, well, it's my prayer and desire that you will be saved. Verse 2, for I bear them record that they have zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Yes, they were so zealous in making sure they kept the different feasts and the different ceremonies that God had given to them. They kept all the feast days. They did all these things. But they neglected, verse 4, Jesus Christ. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. They had all this, but they didn't get to the end. The whole purpose behind it was to come to Jesus Christ, and they did not. They were zealous, but their zeal was misguided. We need to be zealous according to the word of God. Zeal must be tempered with love. 1 Corinthians 13. You know this chapter. I want to read a few couple of verses here. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. All zeal must be tempered with love. 1 Corinthians 13, going to read verses 1, 2, and 3. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity or love, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am am nothing and though i bestow all my goods to feed the poor and though i give my body to be burned and have not charity it profiteth me nothing paul had spent (coughs) a few years in ephesus throughout the land there and he decided that he wanted to journey to jerusalem So he starts to proceed through Greece, spending three months. And then he went into Philippi and Trios and Miletus. And when he got to Miletus, he sent for the elders from Ephesus. He says, come and join me. I want to have one more time with you before I leave, because he knew it was a one-way trip. This is the words that he spoke in Acts chapter 20. I love this passage, Acts chapter 20. Paul's parting words, verse 17. And he says there, and from Elitus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lining of weight of the Jews, and how I kept nothing back that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and the faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witness in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me. He says, none of this bothers me. Doesn't upset me. Whether it's all looking good, or whether I'm going to be in bonds and imprisoned. And he knew the outcome for that. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that ye among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. 
Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you the counsel of God. Here Paul said he wants to finish his course with joy. Nothing bothered him. Problems, trials, ups, downs, it didn't bother him. He just wanted to finish his course with joy. Joy is a motivating factor. In fact, in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 44, there's the man who finds the field, and the Bible says, for joy, he went and sold all that he had, and then he came that he might buy the field with the hidden treasure. 1 Corinthians 11, chapter 11 and verse 1. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. It says, follow the example that I have left, but only as my example has been following the example of Jesus Christ. Christ should be the center of every message, of everything that we do. Do you remember how we mentioned earlier that a zealous person, you know, we might say they were a very enthusiastic person. The word enthusiastic is the Latin word entheos. En, E-N, is the same as the word in. Theos is the word God, theology. Entheos, enthusiastic, means in God. It's interesting, isn't it? How many people say, I'm enthusiastic, but they say, I don't believe in God. The word actually means to be in God. We should always be looking to God. In fact, Hebrews chapter 12, turn across to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, looking at verse 2, the Bible says they're looking unto Jesus, the author and finish it. You know, we can't take credit for anything because Jesus was there at the start and he's there at the end. The author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Here we find Jesus endured the cross, the shame, Naked, hungry, rejected, up there. He endured it all, the Bible says. Why? What was it that motivated Christ to stay on the cross? He could have come down. What was it that held him there to endure the humiliation, the ridicule, and ultimately the death of the cross for you? And for me, what is it that kept him there? The Bible says, who for the joy that was set before him. Just as the man who sold the field, Christ stayed on the cross because of joy. Luke chapter 15, turn across to Luke chapter 15, verse 7. And I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repented more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. One sinner that repents means that there is joy in heaven. But where is this joy? Look down at verse 10. The Bible says again, Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. So picture this. You've got in heaven, there's one sinner has repented. In heaven, there's joy. And the Bible says that the joy is emanating within the presence of the angels of God. The joy isn't originating with the angels, but in their presence. Whose presence are they in? They are in God's presence. The joy is coming from God and continues on over one person. Maybe that's me. Maybe that's you. One person that repents. Your zeal should be contagious. It should strengthen and motivate others. In fact, he says there in 2 Corinthians, 
chapter 9, just turn across to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and looking at verse 1 and verse 2. For as touching the ministering of the saints, it is superfluous for me to write unto you. You already know this, he says. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them in Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal has provoked very many. Have you ever seen someone, you know, you might say that person is on fire. Someone who was zealous for God and zealous for what they were doing, and suddenly from just being around them, it rubs off. Has that happened to you before? Maybe you're the person, and you rubbed off on the other person. Amen? You know, in Psalms 119, verse 139, he says, My zeal has consumed me. What's he saying? He says, I have a great burden on my heart for my loved ones and for others. The zeal is there. I want to do whatever I can. God, use me in however you can. You know, and back in Hebrews 12 there, just turning back to Hebrews chapter 12, we're told to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. I want to go to verse 1, the verse before it. And it says, Wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, the joy that is set before us. There's such a cloud of witnesses, of zealous people throughout the ages who have stood firm to speak boldly for their faith in Jesus Christ. You know, the scriptures uses a term, the term cloud, to describe these people. I was thinking about the, the word cloud. The word ao, ao, means clouds. T, T E A, means white. And roa means long. Together it's the land of the long white cloud. Ao, tia, roa. You know, some legends say that Aotearoa was the name of the canoe that the explorer Kupi was in, and that he named the land after the canoe. Other virgin, versions say that the canoe was guided by a long white cloud in the course of the day and by a long bright cloud at night. Either way, you know, we all live in Aotearoa, the land of the long white clouds. You know, the book of Revelation tells us that Jesus is going to come on a white cloud. You know, don't look for a popular message. It never has been. But when you hear it and live it, when you truly accept Jesus into your heart, when you become enthused, when you become filled with the Spirit of God, God's Word gets into your very being. It becomes who you are. And you cannot, you cannot keep silent. You know, I want to share two more verses in Esther chapter 4. Just before Job, Esther, chapter 4, which is just before Psalms. Looking at verse 14, the Bible tells us in the book of Esther, For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. We know that last bit. Who knows whether it's this time? God's got you prepared for now. But you know what? If you don't do it, somebody else will. 
If you don't stand up and be zealous for the cause of God, somebody else will. Last verse, Jeremiah 20. One of my favorite, Isaiah, Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 8 and verse 9. Verse 8 of chapter 20, For since I spake, I cried out, I cried violence and spoil, because the word of God of the Lord was made a reproach unto me, and a derision daily. Constantly he was attacked. Verse 9, Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. He said, I'm going to stop it. I've had enough. God can find somebody else to go through all the trouble. I'm being blamed all the time. I'm being attacked all the time. But he couldn't. I love the last bit. But his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary for with bearing and I could not stay. The pot was boiling and it's getting hotter. I'm holding the lid down, but the lid's not going to stay down. It's going to blow out. Because God's word is in my heart, it's in my life, it's in my bones, it's in my being. You know, why not be zealous for New Zealand? For the beautiful people of this wonderful land, reach out and impact someone's life for the kingdom of God. Be a zealous Christian that many people in this land may be ready to look up and see that white cloud on which stands the Son of God. Amen. is so big, the ocean so grand, the sky so immense, but where did it come from? If we say God created it, well who created God? What is God? Is God spirit? Is God physical? Is God three or is God one? Is it possible to find God? Can we understand who God is? The Bible says that if you search for God with your whole heart, He will be found of you. That's the hard part for me, maybe for you. Am I willing to search with my whole heart? Am I happy to accept the answers that I might find? Are you exploring the scriptures to understand more about the God who created all things? How far are you willing to go in search of the true God? Can dead men speak? Do our departed loved ones, do they try to communicate with us? There's many people who claim that they can talk to our deceased loved ones, but are they really talking to them? Or are they communicating with someone or, or something else? We love our fathers, our mothers, our brothers, our sisters, our cousins, our grandparents, great-grandparents. Wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to talk to them again? 
just to even get some of the knowledge they had, just to tell them that you love them. There are many people who claim that they can communicate with the dead, but what if it's not really true? What if it's not the dead, our departed loved ones that they're talking to? What does the Bible really teach happens when somebody dies? Do you get dead men talking? These are questions that we need to explore. These are answers that you're going to receive from this presentation. The Bible doesn't leave us ignorant in regards to these questions, but it's very clear because God doesn't want us to be deceived. He loves our loved ones more than we do, and God has an answer to all your questions, and I pray that you'll find those answers in the message you're about to watch. The perception of society is that if we're a little bit different or we don't seem to fit in, then we're not really a part of it. We're not a part of this family of humanity. Really when you think about it, we're created by God and God has a plan for each one of us. You know, we get to choose if we're a part of his family. You know, he says that he wants to adopt us, that we can be his children. God says he has a society that's eternal, that's going to last forever. We don't have to be alone, it's a choice whether we stay alone or not, or whether we join the family of God. God wants you to be his child. He doesn't care where you've been, but he says it'll make you his sons and his daughters. He wants to make you the Israel of God. What is a soul? What is a spirit? Is the soul some kind of floaty thing that floats off at the point of death? Sometimes we read things in the Bible and we have our own ideas of what they mean. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 23 says, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Is a spirit and a soul the same thing? The prophet Isaiah wrote in Isaiah chapter 26 verse 9, With my soul have I desired thee in the night, Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. So what are we? Spirits? Souls? These are things we need to find out from the word of God. It was the wise King Solomon. He said, there's a way which seems right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. You know, the Bible tells us in the book of James, chapter 1 and verse 5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not. Wisdom doesn't come from man, but wisdom comes from God. I remember the words that were spoken of those men who heard Jesus speak. 
And they said never before had they heard the words spoken as Jesus spoke. Never a man had they heard like Jesus Christ. You know, when we look at the Bible, it's interesting. It looks like just a collection of words. It's, it's white pages, black writing. It looks like a very dumb book, silent. But really, when you hold it in your hands, it is the most powerful book that you will ever hold. It has the ability with the words that are written there. And when you read it, when you apply it to your life, to change you, to change your life, to change the way you think, the things you think about, the way you want to live, the direction you want to go. When Jesus spoke, he, he spoke many parables. And sometimes we focus on just a small portion of what he said. But other times it can be important to look at the bigger picture, to find out what was he really telling me to do? What is he asking you to do? We're going to explore that today in one of the most famous times that Jesus sat and spoke to you and I. I hope you've enjoyed the message that you've just watched. If you'd like to learn more about this topic, or maybe there's other things you'd like to learn about, just feel free to contact us. You can call or you can text on 02111 85483, or just check out the website below. 